There's a, a lot of first timers here today. I see a lot of new freshmen and I see a lot of uh, people I've never seen before. I don't know how old you are, so I don't want to assume. But uh, welcome. Uh, over the next few weeks, uh, I know things, uh, especially if it's your first time here, there are some things that we do uh, differently. Uh, and so over the next few weeks, uh, we will start explaining some of these things to you so hopefully you don't feel too lost and too confused as to where we are. Um, we are actually towards the end of our uh, studies in the book of Genesis. We're, we'll be in Genesis 45 today, uh, and within the next uh, two months or so, we'll be wrapping up the book of Genesis, continuing on to the book of Acts. Um, so for those of you guys who haven't been here for the last you know, year that we've been doing this, I encourage you to go through, uh, catch up on the story of Genesis. I think it'll have, um, it'll add a lot of uh, it'll add a foundation to everything we are going to be talking about today and for the, the rest of the summer as well. So we welcome you. We encourage you to uh, ask questions. We also encourage you today especially uh, to join us after service for, um, for fellowship. Um, even if you didn't sign up, I forgive you. I put some threats last night about if you don't sign up, you don't get to eat. And then like five people signed up. And then uh, Tim Kim signed up like an hour ago. So... Don't think I don't see those things. So it's all right. Uh, please join us. We encourage you to join us. So if you would turn your Bibles with me to Genesis 45, we'll be reading from verses 1 through 15. Uh, and we'll add some context after the reading of the word of the Lord. Genesis 45, verse 1 through 15. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. And to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh. And Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come. So that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Um, so, setting a context for what has happened here, uh, for those of you guys, I mean, I can't get into too much detail about who Joseph and his brothers are, but uh, Joseph is one of 12 brothers, and he was the one favored the most, not only by his own physical father, Jacob, his biological father, but also his heavenly father, God. Um, and... And because of all this extra favor that was upon him, his brothers, uh, it says, literally says they hated him. And at one point, they plotted to murder him when they saw him coming from a distance. And Judah, uh, one of his older brothers, the, the fourth oldest brother at the time, actually decided to say, let's not kill him. Let's sell him off into slavery uh, so we can make some money out of it. So um, through, this, uh, through their manipulation and through them throwing in a pit and all that happened, Joseph gets sold into Egypt. But at the end of the day, uh, 22 years later as we know it, um, it has been 22 years since he's been sold. Uh, Joseph has risen from absolute poverty and slavery into absolute 
prominence. He, he even has the, the galls to say, uh, I, I am a father to Pharaoh. You know, I mean, there, uh, Pharaoh, who considered himself a god, king over all of Egypt, said, I am like a father to him. I am lord over all of Egypt. And that's the kind of authority that he had. Uh, and right before he reveals himself to them, he, uh, he through his own manipulation, uh, acted like he was going to take his brother Benjamin into slavery and send the brothers back to Jacob, uh, who were in Canaan while he was in Egypt. Uh, and these brothers, uh, and Judah himself, the very person who said, let's sell him off into slavery, uh, let's make a profit out of this instead of just killing him. Uh, last week we talked about this. Uh, prostrates himself at Joseph's feet and says, take me instead. God has found out about my sin, not just right now, but God has found out about how sinful I am. Let me take the place of my brother Benjamin. Because if, uh, if, if you take Benjamin... Our father, and he doesn't know that it's Joseph's father as well, he will die. He will hear this news that Benjamin is in slavery, and, he will and it says he will take his gray hairs down to Sheol. So for the sake of my father, please take me instead. Uh, for those of you guys who weren't here, that actually shows Judah's complete repentance from where he was. Someone that was willing to sell his brother off into slavery is now uh, the person who is laying his own life down for the sake of his brother. And our passage today, as we got into it, Joseph hears this. Joseph sees the repentance of Judah, and it says he could not control himself. And that's where we find ourselves today. Joseph finally reveals himself to his 11 brothers, saying, I am the brother that you sold off into slavery. Um, to the point where what's really interesting is I, I find it ironic in a sense that Joseph basically told all his servants to, like, leave, right? But then he still cried loud enough. He, he, I mean, uh, out, of, out of joy and sorrow and, 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 and all the emotions that, are, that he's going through as he reveals himself to his brothers, he is crying so much that the people outside, you know, the people that had already been sent out can hear him crying on the inside. It says even all of Pharaoh's household could hear him as he was weeping and, and revealing himself to his brothers and saying, it is I, Joseph. And the brothers were shocked, obviously, for, for, for many Many reasons, because uh, this same brother who had, uh, the same Joseph who had spoken to them harshly, uh, now is weeping and saying, it is I, Joseph, is my father well. Uh, bring, bring, it, is, it is I, I'm not angry at you, I forgive you, this was God's plan for me. Um, he is no longer speaking to them through a translator, but he is speaking to them in their own tongue. Can you imagine uh, someone... Uh, in an authority figure that was using a translator to speak to you, all of, all of a sudden is now crying, trying to embrace you and speaking in your tongue, speaking in your language. The same person who had treated you harshly. And uh, he was, uh, people say governor, prime minister, lord over the land. Uh, he had an Egyptian name. It was Zaphneth Panea. Uh, we learned about this around eight chapters ago. He had an Egyptian name. So they knew him as prime minister. They knew him as governor. They knew him as lord. They knew him as the person in charge of Egypt. They knew him as Zaphnath Panea, who has risen to prominence in all of Egypt. But now he is revealing himself to them as Joseph. He is no longer revealing, he is no longer putting up this, uh, I mean, not that it's a front, because he is an authority figure. But he's not coming to them as an authority figure. He's coming to them as a long lost brother. And obviously, the brothers uh, are going through a lot of emotions as well. Hey, we tried to kill you 22 years ago. And now you are in the most prominent position in all the world, as far as we know at that time. Uh, uh, th there had been a famine in that land for two years to the point. And Egypt was the only place where they actually saved up enough grain because of Joseph's um, uh, interpretation of Pharaoh's dream that they spent seven years stockpiling grain. So all the other countries were now looking towards Egypt for help and support. So they are the most powerful country in the world. Joseph is the most powerful person in all of Egypt. And we're going, oh, we try to sell you off into slave. Uh, we tried to kill you 22 years ago. Then we decided to, uh, we decided to sell you 
up into slavery. And as we know uh, from two chapters ago, even though Joseph was begging them, please don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. Did you not hear the boy crying out to you? I mean, because obviously Joseph is not just going to willingly let himself be sold off into slavery, especially by people that he thought were his brothers and that loved him and cared for him. Please don't do this. The last thing they, they saw Joseph was him getting dragged off into slavery by the Midianites, looking back at them going, why would you do this to me? And now he is standing over them in a position of power. They're going, what is going to happen? Is he, I mean, in that raw emotional state that he's in, is he, is he, wait, is he actually happy or is he angry and he's going to take himself out on us and, and get vengeance for everything that we have done to him? However, we know, looking at this objectively in Scripture, that Joseph has wanted this moment from the beginning, from when he first saw his brothers. <coughs> uh, and we know that he's already forgiven them. Um, how do we know this? Uh, first and foremost, when he first sees them, he pulls them aside and says, what's your family like back home? Who do you, are you ten brothers here? Who, do you guys have a father? Oh, you guys have a father? Is he doing well? And when he finds out his father is still one, his little brother is still doing well, he actually uh, left the room at that time and wept for the first time. Uh, and not only did he, wept the, uh, did he weep that one moment, uh, he wept again uh, prior to this as he had uh, sent his brothers back while keeping Simeon. He wept again, constantly being overwhelmed by his emotions to his brothers. There's a grown man that is crying and weeping uh, the first two times in private in his own chambers because he is so happy to be seeing his brothers again. And lastly, we know that he's already forgiven them because he didn't kill them right away. I mean, he was, uh, he was in a position of absolute power and authority that if, if 10 random uh, people, we, they, they weren't even known as Israelites back then, right? Because Israel only had 11 known sons at that time. They weren't a tribe yet. There were just 11 people. This one family showed up, and if Joseph, Zaphnath Paneh, who was in charge of all of Egypt, just said, kill them all, no one would have batted an eye. Joseph is in charge of everything. Who cares about 11, 10, 11 random brothers that are coming through his door, begging and asking for food? So we know that he's already forgiven them, uh, but the brothers don't know that. We know that, but the brothers are going, what is happening? This person is now weeping, this brother, and, and, and this says they were distra distressed and dismayed. They don't know what's going on. And so these brothers are rightfully so stunned at what is happening. Uh, again, remember, they considered killing him, and they did sell him in, off into slavery. They may even be thinking about, because of uh, what has happened recently with current events to them, which is that there was a silver cup that was stolen, supposedly by Benjamin, and they don't know what's going on with that situation, that um, they think they're about to die. They know what they deserve. They've already confessed to each other uh, in front of Joseph, but they, they were speaking in Hebrew, so they thought Joseph didn't know, um, that they already confessed that, you know, God has found out our sins. Our sins have caught up to us. Everything that we have done, we are reaping the punishment for the sin that we have committed. And we deserve this. And so they are rightfully stunned. And they're going to themselves, we're going to die. We deserve this. I can't believe Joseph's alive. And I guess it's the end of our life. And rightfully so. But in, in this moment is where we see the beauty, not, of this, not only of this story, but, but for the unfolding drama of redemption that we see today. It's where we see the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, Joseph reassures them constantly, twice in today's chapter. And he'll actually, we'll touch upon this in a few weeks when we go over Genesis 50 as well. He constantly reassures them. You meant this for evil. You had wicked ideas. You had a wicked plan. You, didn't, you, you thought ill of me. You, you literally, from the bottom of your heart, wanted to kill me. And you actually sold me off into slavery. But this was God's plan all along. Forget all that. Please bring my father to me. 
Right, that's the kind of love and the passion. He's like, I've already forgiven you. I've already forgiven you because this is this was this has obviously been revealed to me as God's plan that you may be saved, that our family may be saved, that God will fulfill the promise that He made to Abraham, uh, Abraham, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I don't know who Abraham is, but um, and, and and again, so He reminds them three times, as far as we know. This is God's plan. I've forgiven you. This is God's plan. I've forgiven you. Uh, this is God's plan that His will and His uh, that His will would be accomplished not only in our lives but in the promise that He had made to our forefathers, and the promise that He will make eventually for the salvation of the entire world. This was also God's plan that we. That they may see, that we may see what true reconciliation looks like. What it truly looks like for a relationship that was broken to be restored. Uh, I find it very interesting in verses 14 and 15. At first, um, Joseph and Benjamin uh, weep on each other's necks. Obviously, they were obviously in an embrace of, of some sort, and they're weeping on each other's necks. By the way, um, I, I know, I, I, know I, I joke around quite a bit about uh, men shouldn't cry, and for those of you guys who don't know me, I have a rule that I'm only allowed to cry twice a year because real men don't cry, uh, and tears are signs of weakness, right? Uh, I believe Ron Swanson said something like that. It's all right. Um, but I actually think men shouldn't cry, and especially back in these days, uh, back in the time uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, weeping as a man was something that, especially in public, was considered unacceptable. You literally were showing your weakness when you were weeping. Um, I think that's why at first Joseph uh, sends all his uh, servants away. Why the last two times Joseph actually wept thinking about his brothers, he ran off into his own chambers so he could cry without other people seeing. And it was considered a sign a weakness for a man to cry. There's a lot of things in Scripture, actually, where it shows that, um, that there, are, there are things that men weren't supposed to do, yet for the sake of love, yet for the sake of what Jesus has done, shows um, men, leaders, showing their weakness, in a sense, by showing their love and their compassion and their emotions. If you ever hear the story about, uh, we're actually talking about that when we see a bunch of dudes kissing each other. Right, uh, brothers, uh, later on in, in the New Testament, when you hear the story of the parable of the prodigal son, how a father in, in, in full uh, authority sees his son coming from a distance and literally likes what amounts to his dress. It's a robe, I know, but it's a dress as far as I'm concerned. And runs towards his coming son. That's the kind of... Uh, that's the kind of sacrifice these loving figures make in Scripture to show and to reveal God's immense passion for his own people. So Joseph and Benjamin are weeping on each other's necks out of joy after having not seen each other for 22 years. What's really interesting is that they devote one verse to that, and then the next verse says, uh, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. See, Benjamin wasn't guilty. Benjamin had every right to be overjoyed, to embrace his brother Joseph. I haven't seen you in 22 years. You were sent to go find these 10 brothers 22 years ago, and I thought you were murdered. I thought not murdered. I thought you were killed by a wild animal. But what happens after Joseph has his moment with Benjamin is that he draws his brothers near to him. He kisses them, and he weeps upon these same brothers that had sold them off into slavery 22 years ago. He has embraced them, and he has welcomed them back into fellowship with him. You are my brothers. Despite what has happened in the past, I have not only forgiven you ages ago because of the grace of God that has poured out in my life, I am seeking a restoration of this relationship. He embraces them. He hugs them. He weeps upon them. These very same brothers that are terrified 
that vengeance will be cast and rain down upon them are embraced, are kissed, and are wept upon. Um, kissing is also uh, kind of an odd thing, uh, for us especially. Kissing is a very intimate thing. You don't just kiss random people, uh, especially in a Western culture, right? Like, we, uh, we've been going to Turkey for the last two years. Uh, we're going again this summer. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, every time uh, in, in Turkey, by the way, they always do, they do the kissing on the cheek thing. And, like, I don't even like getting hugged. And, and these people are trying to put their lips on my cheeks. And I'm like, bruh, don't do that. Like, uh, grown men. And, and, you know, it's just, like, it's just like a weird thing that's going on. But what Joseph does is, is, is I mean, by the way, I mean, I think everyone in this room can admit the only person you kiss or you have kissed or you will kiss, hopefully, uh, will be someone that you care for. It will be someone that you're intimate with, someone that knows you, someone you trust. Hopefully, you're not going r kissing random strangers on the street. Joseph, again, when he kisses his brothers, is saying, you're not a stranger. You're not an enemy. You're my brothers. You're my family. I'm happy to see you. And he's revealing his love for them, his compassion for them, that their fears may be eased. That they would no longer feel threatened by Joseph, but they would see the beauty of his desire to restore a relationship. And he is the one that takes the initiative. The brothers are stunned. They may even be backing up a little bit. <laughs> oh, shoot, Joseph is alive. And he's going, no, come here. Come here. Draw near to me. I want to feel your embrace. I want to be with you. I want to let you know I've forgiven you, and I want to let you know that we can be a family again. The irony of this passage, the irony of this story, and the irony of the gospel as it is applied to us is that the one they try to kill has become their savior. Right? The, the man whom the brothers had tried to kill has become their savior. Not only in this moment, but as he explains to him, there's going to be five more years of famine. Come live with me. We're going to live well. We're going to have the land of Goshen. All our family can be together. And your, our family will no longer be in poverty, but we will be in the graces and the mercies and the blessings of God. The man that the brothers tried to kill has become the Savior. The gospel of Jesus Christ says the man who was crucified because of our sin, the man whom we killed, the man who took our sins upon the cross on our behalf, not only has become our Savior, but likewise calls us his brothers and draws us and brings us and woos us back into family. The meta-narrative of everything is that, see, Adam and Eve in the garden, because of their sin, had broken the relationship with God. The same God who created them, the same God who spoke to them, the same God who says he walked in the cool of the evening with them, because of their sin, they were no longer allowed to be in his presence to the point where the Garden of Eden was blocked off with angels wielding flaming swords that they may no longer enter into Eden because of their sin, could not be in the presence of God. That is the relationship that Jesus Christ has restored on the cross for the sake of his brothers, for the sake of his sisters, that we may enter into Eden yet again, that we may enter into paradise yet again, that we may enter into paradise for an eternity by his grace, by his mercy, because of his immense love for us. The same kind of love that Joseph has for his brother to an infinite degree, where Jesus, who we have known to have wept in the New Testament, Jesus humbles himself, first of all, into the form of a human baby. Humbles himself that though he be sinless, though he be spotless, though he be the only righteous and holy one, 
allows himself to be nailed upon a cross that his brothers and his sisters may find their way home and have eternal life. The gospel says, the man whom the brothers have tried to kill has become our savior. That is the beauty of today's story. But what does this mean to us? I hope every single person in this room, in this room, when they hear the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I hope, I sincerely hope and pray from the bottom of my heart that you feel unworthy. And rightfully so. Like these brothers, no, it can't be. No, 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 there's no way you could love me. Why are, you, why, why are you drawing me near to you? Why are you hugging me? Why are you embracing me? Why are you crying on me? Why are you kissing me? There's no way you have this kind of love for me. And rightfully so. Do you know how sinful you are? You are the brothers that try to kill the man who has become our savior. I hope you feel unworthy that you may see the beauty of what Christ has done for you. See, it's so easy if you've been going to church your entire life to just feel worthy of it all. Oh, of course, I've, he I've heard this story since I was in PBS. I've heard this story since I was in third grade. I've heard this story of, of how much God loves me. Of course he loves me. That's his job. And, and maybe you don't say it quite that rudely, but if I turn this around on you, do you know how I know you believe that? Because many of us, including myself in this, in this room, I'm not innocent of this, have a hard time forgiving the people around us. Have a hard time forgiving the people around us. And definitely, if you, maybe you could say to yourself, oh, I've forgiven him, but definitely don't want to be in a relationship with that person anymore. That even if that, and, and well, might I say, if you've forgiven someone and they're not repentant, you don't have reconciliation. There's a difference between that. But there are many of us in this room who know that, that people that have wronged you are apologetic, are repentant, and you're going, I can't trust you again, never again. How dare I welcome you back here? See, what's crazy is that it, it happens in churches. Uh, and that's the point of church discipline, by the way. For, uh, by the way, uh, hopefully you guys, uh, as you go to church, eventually someone will be disciplined in a church. The whole point of church, for, uh, church discipline, like literally to the point where you fence off communion, where you kick the person out of the church and say, you are not welcome here until you are repentant. See, uh, there's so many times I've heard stories about uh, uh, where people get excommunicated from church because of their sin. And rightfully so. And so many people in the church are like, finally! I hated that guy. He was kind of creepy. I hated that girl. She was so proud and angry and sassy. I don't know why that last part is a sin, but whatever. Right? Like, I mean, it's like, it's like this idea of like, oh, I'm so glad that person is not in our church anymore. While the whole point of God's desire in the gospel and God's desire for relationship with us is that the relationship that's broken may be restored. So I know people in this room, including myself, often take the gospel of Jesus Christ lightly because of our relationships with the people around us. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you hold bitterness towards? Um, we're about to go out on missions in two weeks. Uh, I've, been, I've been going on missions for the last seven. I was six. I was fifteen when I first went. Fourteen. Oh my goodness, two decades. <laughs> it's 
20 years. I'm old, all right? I've been going on missions for 20 years, except for like, actually, no, every trip I've been on, there's been beef. I've heard, I hear, uh, even in this church, right, I hear stories about other teams that I haven't even been on. First of all, they went to a trip to Cambodia, and they actually eventually ended up calling that team Team Beef Bodia, right? Like, ridiculous. Um, I can't even begin to tell you the number of times I've, I've, number of missions trips I've been on where it's like half the time you, you're, you're, you're dealing with interpersonal relationships amongst your teammates rather than doing the work that God has called you to do. Who do you need to forgive? With whom do you need the relationship restored? Because if you knew what God had done for you, if you truly understood the depths of what Christ has accomplished for your sake on the cross, why do you have such a hard time forgiving the people around you? Again, there is a level beyond just mere forgiveness where there is repentance, there is reconciliation. And this is God's desire for the restoration of our relationship with him and for us on a personal level with the people around us. And yes, this is absolutely supposed to echo the two greatest commandments that we know in Scripture. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You can't, you can't just have a right relationship with God and not seek a right relationship with the people around you. First John makes that very clear. Whoever says that they love God but hates his brothers does not know God. And I'm, I, I did not, I'm not going to go there. This is what God is saying. How are you going to hate the people around you? I don't know who you, I don't know who you guys are. I don't know your relationships. I don't know half of you. I don't know half your relationships. I don't know half the, half the drama that you guys go through. Um, I actually find out about a lot of your drama eventually, but I usually find out like six months later. So I'm just like way behind the curve because I'm like 35 and no one wants to tell me anything, which I'm okay with because I don't want to deal with your drama all the time. I don't know what you're going through in life, but I know you have relationship issues. I know that the vast majority of us in this room are showing up at 1.30 on a Sunday, not just for tacos, but because they know God and they know of God. But I mean, let's just, let's just be honest here. Some of us hate our parents. How could you raise me like that? See, some of, us, some of our parents were like way too overprotective and tried to be in every little aspect of our life. And some of our parents work like 80 hours a week and we're never there, but the result is the same. You hate your parents, you haven't forgiven them, and you don't desire to restore a relationship with them. Some of you guys hate this church. Some of you guys that have been born and raised in a Korean church hate the Korean church and hate the people that lead the Korean church. And you know why I say this? Because I was one of them. And I am one of them. And I am working through the issues as one of them. <laughs> You know how many times I've heard from your mouths, the Korean church doesn't care about us anyways. Why should I care about them? Some of you have people that you call friends in this room that you secretly bicker about behind their back. And I'm not calling anyone because I don't know and I don't care. Well, I mean, I care, but I don't like actually care to know the details, right? The don't, please don't tell me. Worst private messages ever. 
But here's the challenge that I have for you all. Consider your heart attitudes. Consider who you are and what you've done to God. Consider that, forget being our brother or a sister, that you were an absolute enemy of God. Consider what he has done for you. Consider his love. Consider his grace. Consider his mercy. Consider his compassion. Consider him who is holy of holies, king of kings, lord of lords, omniscient, omnipotent, omni-everything God, a creator, sustainer, judge, king. Consider your wicked sinfulness and his love for you, despite that, that he would humble himself to be nailed upon a tree. That you could not earn your favor with him, but that he takes the initiative and he woos you. He just says, believe. If you've been forgiven of much, I hope and pray that you consider your heart attitudes towards the people around you. Uh, Bitterness is hard. I think I've shared this before, and I will end with this. I've held rage and bitterness in my heart towards my own biological father for years. For years and years and years. And it led me to some of the most miserable places of my life. Uh, For those of you guys who don't know, my father ran away before I was born. And in third grade, I, I, I thought to myself, hey, how come I don't have a father in the house while all the white people around me do? I lived in a white neighborhood, and they all have happy families for some reason. Um... Actually, not anymore, which is also kind of sad. Hey, Pastor Man be telling me God loves me and that God is my father, but the father that I know was never around. Hey, I'm angry. And I, and I can't blame my, my father for everything, but it's like, hey, I, I'm going to lash out at the world. I hate him. As I hate him, I started ruining myself. I'll admit, I hated him, and I started ruining myself. I started uh, abusing my own body with, with, with drugs, alcohol, whatever it may be. I started abusing myself, and I started taking it out on me, and my bitterness that I had towards someone that was beyond me was killing me. I hope and pray that if you know you've been forgiven, that you would not let that bitterness take root in your heart. It will wear you down. It will kill you. But may you find the love of Jesus Christ. May you find it to be real, not only in your life. And as he has sought restoration with you, may you seek restoration with others. May you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And may you love your neighbor as yourself. Let me pray for us.